in need of thy mercy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm sure most of you know, but for those of you who don't, you know, since we're going to do uh, a, a rosary uh, throughout the day in the course of a, uh, a gathering of the pious, uh, that we actually receive a plenary indulgence, as you know. We're sort of stretching it out throughout the day, but a plenary indulgence is available to us because we're saying the rosary is a group. Another wonderful uh, blessing for being Catholic. Skip right over that purgatory business. Uh, <laughs> you know what's that, Charlie? Okay. Uh, when we talk about hell, there are two good things about it. Really? Really? There's two good things about hell? Yes. One is that it demonstrates the justice of God. The second thing is that by thinking about hell, not preoccupied thinking, but thinking about hell and meditating on it for a while, uh, we come to learn all sorts of other truths about the Catholic faith as well. All of the teaching of the church stands in relation to all the other teachings of the church. There's no one teaching that's sort of sitting there and all the rest have nothing to do with it. So every teaching fits in with every other teaching, just as you have uh, the threads of a garment. There's no one thread that hangs out isolated from the garment. It's all part of the same thing. Um, so as we talk about hell, there are a number of things that, another, a number of other Catholic truths that sort of jump to the forefront, uh, such as the opposite. Well, what's the opposite of hell? Well, the opposite is heaven. But more than just sort of one end of the extreme or the other, it's a difference in magnitude and kind and kind. We need to understand that given our natural fallen states, our natural end now is hell. Our supernatural end is heaven. And without supernatural assistance, we go to where our natural end inclines us to go. So in this sense, heaven and hell are not exactly opposites that we just sort of stand in the middle of and go to one or the other. We are naturally drawn to the hell side because that's the composition of our fallen human natures. Sin is attractive to us. Sin is repulsive to God. It isn't just a, oh, you made a bad choice. You're a good person, but you made a bad choice. No. When someone is damned, they are not a good person anymore. They may have been while they were here on earth for a while, but our natural end will incline us towards hell and its consequences. There, our supernatural end is heaven. It is our destiny. We were created for heaven. We were not created for hell. Nonetheless, given the current state of our, of our fallen world, this is where we are inclined to go. How does somebody wind up in hell? Someone ends up in hell because ultimately they choose to be there. Now they may not choose, oh, I think all jumping around in fire and brimstone and horrible demons and all of that is a great thing and that's what I want to do. That's not the point. Some people misunderstand when you say people choose hell. No, they make choices throughout their life, the consequence of which is hell, without really maybe understanding the full consequence of what they choose. But this is true also on the heaven side of the equation too, isn't it? Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it even entered into the harder mind of man what God has prepared for those who love him. We have a dim, very, very dim awareness of something that's heavenly, that's a reward, a, this is where we should be, but none of us really chooses what heaven is because we don't know what heaven is exactly. We can't even imagine it, the sacred scripture tells us. All we know is we have a vague understanding that this is where we're supposed to be. It's good. We will be perfected. We will be with God. So in that sense, as we stand here on earth, the hell consequence and the heaven consequence of our actions aren't fully understood on either side. But we know, because of the choices we make here on earth, we, in, we move to one of these and eventually uh, spend eternity in one of them. 
Since hell is kind of our natural uh, end because of our fallen human nature, as I said earlier, we need supernatural assistance to attain a supernatural end. If you imagine for a moment that a uh, if you imagine for a moment that somebody jumps into the ocean and they have no breathing apparatus with them at all and they just go down to the bottom of the ocean, well, what's going to happen to them? Well, they're going to die. They're going to die because they don't have the assistance they need to live in that atmosphere because their natural way of being is to breathe air and obtain oxygen from the air. In the water, they don't have the mechanism, like the fish do, to be able to live in that environment, so they die. So in order to live in that environment, they need something outside of their natural being in order to live in that. So they need scuba equipment and oxygen tanks and that sort of thing. In heaven, as we, as we proceed there, we get supernatural oxygen tanks, so to speak, to be able to be in the presence of God, to be in the ocean of God. And we can only survive there if we have sanctifying grace. And sanctifying grace is, quite simply, the life of God. Now, hell is not... One of the things I want as the conference goes on is first to see that heaven and hell while they're certainly opposites of each other, there's something much greater at work there than just, you know, this is choice A and this is choice B, like the old let's make a deal show with Monty Hall. It's not like choose behind the curtain or curtain one or curtain two. It's a little bit more than that. Uh, it becomes an inclining to something. In hell, we are not made to be like the devil. But in heaven, we are made to be God-like. It's our call. It's why we were created in the, in the divine image, in the image and likeness of God. And that image and likeness of God is perfected in heaven. The, we are not perfected, so to speak, in the image of Satan in hell. We certainly share the same qualities of uh, the damned, share the same qualities of uh, rebellion against God, hatred, and all those things, but they don't become, they don't become Satan-like, like we become God-like in heaven. Heaven changes us into something we could never really be here on earth, whereas hell perfects somebody in the evil that they had already inclined themselves towards here on earth. A lot of people, as we know, have this silly uh, comeback. Well, God would never create hell and throw people in there deliberately. God's a loving God. That statement, if somebody ever says that to you, how many of you have heard that said to you? All right. <laughs> that statement reveals a, in, an enormous lack of understanding of the nature of God, an enormous lack of understanding of the nature of sin. So when someone says that to you, it's like a kindergartner talking to you, a spiritual kindergartner. They see that the, the, the question is as basic, or the comment is as basic as why is the grass green? You've got to start with some very basic, very basic catechesis to understand that. The first thing we have to understand uh, that the world has simply given up on today is the, is the notion of sin. Hell, of course, seems impossible because what would you do to get there? Well, you'd have to commit sin. Well, that's okay. God understands. So there's no, really no sin. If there is, I just say, I'm sorry, go on about my life, die, and go to heaven, right? You've been to a Catholic funeral lately? Um, so the idea that there is uh, a sin that somehow is not, or sin generally, is not entirely offensive and repulsive to God is the starting point in all of this. Hell is somewhere further down the road, so it's a little difficult to preach to somebody about hell when they don't even accept the idea of sin being enormously repulsive, infinitely repulsive to God. Uh, I can't remember which saint said it, but um, he said that uh, sin offends an infinite God infinitely. Everything that happens in God, in the interior life of God, is infinite because that's who God is. 
So you can't do something to God or say something to God without it having an infinite effect for us. It's the whole idea, that little understanding is the whole idea of Catholics lighting candles, right? You light a candle, sit there, kneel, say your prayer, or stand if you can't kneel for whatever the case is, and then you walk away and you go on about your life. But guess what? That candle is still there burning even when you're not conscious of it anymore. Your prayer is still standing there in its symbolic form of this candle being prayed to God even though you're off at the grocery store going, you know, picking up your dry cleaning or whatever it is you're doing. So all of the rich symbolism of Catholicism is there for a reason. Now the way God has put us together, he has put together human beings in a, what would appear to be a non-complementary form. Spirit and matter. What an odd combination. Seriously, think about this for a moment. What an odd combination it, it appears as we look at this with our non-God brains that we have this ability to reflect on the infinite, however murky it might be to us, and yet scratch our cheek at the same time. How incredibly bizarre. I'm often fond of saying when we're sitting, when people in the studio and us, we all go out to eat, I'll say something frequently like, we're having ice cream, I love dessert, I love chocolate, and I'm sitting there munching away and I'll say, my poor angel, my poor angel, he will never, ever be able to taste this chocolate Oreo ice cream cookie. <laughs> and of course the answer I get back is, well yeah, but he's beholding the face of God right now. And I'm like, well if I play my cards right, I will too, and I got to eat the chocolate ice cream. <laughs> So what an odd combination of spirit and matter. And so we think of, we think of the, the, the union of these two things, which is who we are. You know, I'm not my soul in this body. This body is me. It doesn't sum me up totally, but it is me. Each one of our bodies are us. What's the relationship between the body and soul then for humans, or spirit and humans? Well, the soul, the spirit, gives life to the body. It causes the heart to pump and the brain waves to move. It causes all that to happen, the soul. Our spirit uh, gives us the uh, uh, faculty of reason and the uh, power of will. But the body gives us, gives our souls, our spirits, the ability to express themselves. So when you are uh, wrapped in prayer and you are kneeling and something comes to you with uh, an image in your mind and you feel goosebumps on your flesh because of that, your angel will never experience that. It doesn't have flesh. When you reach down and feel your child and pick him or her up when they're crying about something, well, is that not an action of both your soul and your body combined? Everything we do is soul and body combined. It's who we are. So we have to understand both heaven and hell. Today's conference is about hell, so we'll be speaking about this obviously much more about hell in the context of hell. But in the end, when all is done, the world is over, and the whole everything's happened that's going to happen, and our bodies are reunited to our souls, when all of that happens, then what happens to the damned with their bodies? Let's talk about the nature of hell. First, from the uh, corporal side of things, from the body, the physical side of things. Well, we have the question, first of all, of fire. So what kind of fire is it? Well, many of the great saints have sort of sat around and thought on this, meditated this, meditated on this, had their private reflections and interlocutions about this, that the fire of hell is of a sort that burns and burns but never consumes. So it's not a natural 
fire, like we think of as a flame here on earth. It has the same sort of qualities of intensity, but the fires of hell are something far greater. St. Augustine said that comparing the fires of earth to the fires of hell would be like comparing a picture, a painting of a fire to a real fire. St. Augustine. We know that the intensity of hell must be something beyond our imaginings. Let's just go for one moment. If you light a candle, the flame is hot, sure. But if you light a bonfire, the flame is much hotter because it's bigger. The size of a fire, even in, nat in the natural order, affects its heat and its intensity. The fire of hell, we are told, is compared to a lake. The book of Revelation talks about the lake of fire. So, as we then talk about uh, uh, how intense a fire is, the heat is of the flame, we know that in the book of Revelation, we hear that it is in a great big, uh, is likened to being in a great big pit or enclosed area. And there is a lid on it. Well, if you have a fire in the natural order of things that is enclosed, like in a furnace, the heat inside that furnace is much more intense than the heat of, say, a barbecue pit. One, the, 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 there is no way for the heat to escape in the first order. And in the second order, there's no outside cooling air which can kind of reduce the temperature of the fire a little bit. So as we see these images that the Holy Spirit portrays to us in the scripture of hell, it's extraordinarily intense. It's enclosed, it's big, and it's dark. Nowhere do we ever seem to get the impression in sacred scripture that the fires of hell give off light. The flames of hell, from what we can gather from scripture, don't seem to give off light. So what we're talking about here is a, a supernatural type of fire that because it is supernatural, enjoys the qualities of that in taking natural fire and raising it to such an intensity that in the natural order of things, we simply have no comparison. Our Lord says many times, many times in sacred scripture, uh, cast them into the outer darkness where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth, gnashing of teeth. As a matter of fact, as we go through sacred scripture, there's a wonderful priest. Are any of you familiar with, uh, he's, he's uh, died about 10 years ago now, 10, 11 years ago, Father John Harden. Any of you familiar with Father John Harden? Wonderful, wonderful, brilliant, holy man. And uh, he says uh, and echoes a uh, great truth that next to our Lord's divinity, he probably never preached more forthrightly and stalwartly about anything more than hell and how to avoid it. As a matter of fact, if we think about it, the entire Gospels are oriented to this one thing. Avoid hell, avoid hell, and come to what your home is, which is the beatific vision. This is where we want you to be. This is where the Holy Trinity desires that we be. But all of us, by virtue of the fact of Adam's sin, are inclined to this. So it needs an extra pull. You need to be pulled out. So grace Sanctifying grace is the, uh, the way uh, or the, the means by which we aren't present to the dangers of hell anymore in the next life. So we have to ask the question, so what is sanctifying grace? Sanctifying grace is the life of God. It's being so in tuned to the life of God that sin becomes repulsive to us.
advancing in the state of sanctifying grace, that sin becomes repulsive to us, that we don't see a desire of this anymore. Now, that's a very high bar. <laughs> that's a very high bar. My father's 82, and he still says that's a really high bar. I'm 49, well, great, another 30-something years to go, and still we'll be going, wow, does this ever end? But as we look at the nature of this, you know, what is the beatific vision? And let's talk about this first before we get into the notion, get into more detail about hell for the rest of the day. The beatific vision isn't just, it isn't just seeing God. It isn't just seeing that. That's certainly a way it's described, and that aspect of it is true. But it's something, it means that there is absolutely nothing between God and me, between God and you, that you are seen absolutely fully for who you are. Nothing blocks it. I can have a glass of water here and another glass of water here, and they can be, if they had consciousness, they could be aware of each other, but there's still the glass in each glass. Get, the water has to kind of get through to be fully present and understood by the other glass of water. It's, there's always something blocking us here in this life. Even the greatest of the saints have what uh, theologians call an intense light of faith, but it's only in heaven that we have what they call the light of glory. And there's a big difference between the light of faith and the light of glory. The light of faith enables us to move toward God, to choose God, to be aware that we have this shortcoming to continue the journey. That's why it's faith. But in heaven, when we possess God, and listen to the word there, we will possess God. No one on earth possesses God. We will possess God in heaven where we will be joined to him. And what he knows, we will know. We will know it finitely, because we will still be finite creatures, but we will know what God knows, including ourselves. This sort of understanding of heaven, which by the way, doesn't even come close to the reality, when you think about this, and then you think about the other situation of hell, where the souls in hell, the damned, don't care about you, they don't care about themselves. They don't know you. They don't care about anything. They're simply filled with hate. They're filled with hate. In this sense, it's the opposite, but it's something far greater. We are transformed in heaven. The language of theology calls it divinization or deformed. We are formed into God, made in the image and likeness of God. Well, here we are with that fully realized and fully completed, where we are fully known and possess. I want to keep saying that. Think about that for a moment. Possess God. You can't be truly happy with something unless you possess it. Think about that. You can't be truly happy with something unless you possess it. Moms and dads, isn't this why you want your children around you? You still don't possess them, but they're closer to you in that presence than they are when they're in a car or on a plane or off at college being stupid. And speaking from experience, um, you have to possess something when you are in the presence of your beloved. That's why it's, you, it's greater for you to be in their presence than to be away from their presence because you are, while you do not possess them, you are in greater possession of them than if they are out of your presence. In heaven, 
We will possess God. We will possess God. In hell, the damned do not possess anything. They possess nothing. Not only do they not only even possess themselves, they clearly have the knowledge of God that they have is, is a hate-filled knowledge. The damned never see God. Ever. How do we know this? Because our Lord tells us, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. The damned certainly are not of pure heart. The damned never behold the face of God. One glimpse, one instant of possession of God would eradicate their hell for all eternity. So what is it that God desires for us here on earth? Every single thing that we do on earth, everything that comes to us, that we do, that we participate in, is aimed at one end, and that is the possession of God. What theologians call the beatific vision, the beauty, the vision of beauty that is God himself. And when we possess this vision, it isn't just looking at God, there's God and looking back at me, but it's beginning to possess the knowledge, never fully, but the knowledge of God, the attributes of God, where we apprehend the relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit, which is infinite, which is eternal. So we can sit in the Trinity and begin to apprehend the great love that is there. The damned despise this. They despise this. So what about some of the other attributes of hell, the nature of hell? Well, we know that, how many of you here have fasted, and when I mean fasted, I mean not eaten anything, zero, for four days in a row? One week. One month. Nothing. We know in about an hour, if it's not already happened, because I'm kind of hungry right now. <laughs> and you can't walk past the newspaper stand or something. I'll go, oh, that Snickers looks pretty good. I'll take that. In hell, there is a hunger beyond our understanding. Not only a hunger for what should have been and was well within grasp, but also because the bodies will be reunited, there will be a physical hunger elevated to a supernatural degree. Because at that point, uh, after, the, after death and our bodies are reunited to us, everything will be supernatural. The hunger in hell will be such that it is a driving you to the point, driving the dam to the point of insanity kind of hunger that is never satiated. How do we know this? Because our blessed Lord says, woe to you who are filled. You shall go hungry. That's for eternity. The same is true of drink. Woe to you, you shall be thirsty. What's the thirst in hell? What is the thirst that could, that, that could so overtake a body in hell? We know within minutes how much we always need some water. You're thirsty, need a water. Sometimes it's a Coke or a Dr. Pepper, but 
still water. Never again will those lips taste water. Never again will water go down the throat and quench that dryness. And remember the environment that they're in. Fire above, fire below, fire on every side, fire burning through. How intense the thirst in hell must be. It's so intense that when our blessed Lord was relating the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man and the rich man in hell, what did the rich man ask for? Please send Brother Lazarus with a drop of water to put on my tongue to quench these flames. Our Lord's not drawing just pictures here that don't have any relationship to reality. The two things, we'll finish this one, we'll finish this one with the last two comments our Lord makes about hell. First one, uh, uh, where the flame is never extinguished. That tells us that the flames don't consume. They torture, they burn, they have the effect, but it's a supernatural flame because all flames eventually are extinguished because they run out of fuel. These flames don't need fuel to stay alive. And where the worm dieth not. What worm? What's our Lord talking about there, the worm? How horrible would it be for the damned to wake up, so to speak, in hell, realizing that they had it within their power to not be there. Every thought, every memory, every single opportunity of the thousands upon thousands of opportunities that God extended to each and every person to be able to come to him and avoid this, that this was totally avoidable, and they must forever exist in these flames and this torture, knowing that it did not have to be this way, the worm that dieth not. This is the whole point of the church. This is the whole point of our lives, that neither we nor anybody we know that we have contact with ends up in this predicament, this eternal hellfire. And it is eternal, and it is hell, and it is fire. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.